Do I hear an amen? Amen. amen? All right. Okay. I don't know if you're agreeing with me or disagreeing with me as I'm praying, but hopefully this is what we see uh, that the Lord is calling all of us uh, to be and to do. All right, well, this evening, I've already told you what we're going to be looking at. Let's go ahead and and read the text as as we begin. Uh, Luke chapter 9, verses 46 through 50. And again, as we saw this morning, there's really a lot of things in here uh, to to look at, uh, things that we we need to understand, but uh, things that I think will will help us, um, again, serve the Lord better. Uh, Beginning in verse 46, um, Luke writes this, An argument started among them as to which of them might be the greatest. But Jesus, knowing what they were thinking in their heart, took a child and stood him by his side and said to them, Whoever receives this child in my name receives me. And whoever receives me receives him who sent me. For the one who is least among all of you This is the one who is great. John answered and said, Master, we saw someone casting out demons in your name, and we tried to prevent him because he does not follow along with us. But Jesus said to him, Do not hinder him, for he who is not against you is for you. (laughs) Well, may the Lord give us grace to understand how all this really fits together. Sometimes uh, you have to look at some of the other Gospels to see perhaps where it's spelled out a little bit more clearly, to see the connection between all of these things, but uh, hopefully by God's grace we we will this evening. Now, again, uh, by way of reminder this morning, we saw that uh, basically the privilege that the Lord has blessed us with by giving to us His Word. Remember, Jesus had certain things to say, uh, Jesus had certain things to say to His disciples that He didn't say to the crowds. So essentially being the New Testament church, what Paul said of Israel is also true of us when he says this in Romans chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. You know, after he uh, concludes in, in Romans chapter 2 basically saying that, uh, well, everyone has sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, um, even those who possess the law haven't really kept the law and they're condemned by the law. So then he asks this question, what then what advantage has the Jew? Or what is the benefit of circumcision? He says, great in every respect. First of all, that they were entrusted with the oracles of God. Okay, so they, they had the word of God. You know, first of all, it's not first and then second and third, but this is the greatest privilege that they had. Now, the advantage of our being a believer and having the Lord's sign of baptism apply to us being a member of his church is really similar in that it's great in every way, one of the greatest privileges being that we have been entrusted with the Word of God and that that Word, because we're trusting in Jesus, actually applies to us. When the Lord expresses His love towards His people in the Word of God, that expression is directed towards us. When He makes promises, those promises actually belong to us. Uh, He gives to us in the Word the, the wisdom that we need, the guidance that we need to avoid all the snares of the enemy that are all around us, to be able to grow in faith and eventually to make it to heaven. So what's the advantage of being a believer? Well, great in every way, and, and most of all, he's given us his word, which makes us wise unto salvation. That is a tremendous privilege. But let's also remember what we saw this morning, that even though the Lord has given to us Really, everything that he intends to give us, he has given to us all of his truth. There are certain things in this book that we may not understand, that the Lord may not reveal to us until we've grown and matured to the place where we can handle it. Remember how Jesus was telling his disciples he was going to be handed over to, be, you know, to, to men to be crucified and he would be raised again from the dead. But when he told them that, they didn't understand what he was saying. Uh, it was because it was being... Uh, basically kept from them until a time when they would be able to handle it. So we, we learn from that that sometimes the Lord does withhold certain truths from us, doesn't allow us necessarily to understand it, which is why we need to be patient with ourselves. We need to be patient with each other, and we need to be patient with other believers. Uh, you know, one thing that's true of the Reformed faith is that um, we're standing on the backs of some pretty you know, pretty gigantic figures in the history of the church. 
and we have learned a great deal from them. Uh, things that others who basically wanted to reinvent the wheel didn't perhaps quite you know, reach uh, through the years that, that they have existed. But being entrusted with this treasure, we just need to make sure that we don't become prideful and look down upon others because really it's not so much what we know, though that is very important, but it's how we live, how we're honoring the Lord. We may have more knowledge, but the question is, are we living in a way that's pleasing to the Lord? So let's not judge other believers, but rather be patient with them uh, and try to help them and just um, know that the Lord will show them uh, His truth and His time when it's His will. Now this evening, our Lord gives us another lesson on how we are to treat each other and how we're also to treat people who aren't a part of our particular group, uh, and that is with humility. We, we need to be patient with regard to our understanding, but we also uh, need to um, just be, be humble towards one another and serve one another within the body and serve those who are outside the body of Christ. Now, first of all, we are to be humble towards one another. And here's our first point. We read in verse 46, an argument started among them as to which of them might be the greatest. As the disciples were, were traveling around from place to place, you know, they were talking among themselves and, um, you know, there isn't really much more to do when you're traveling on foot. You know, there's a lot of time uh, it takes to get various places when you're not ministering or when Jesus perhaps is not uh, teaching you, then they would talk among themselves. And on this particular occasion, the subject arose as to which of them would be the greatest in the Lord's kingdom. Now again, they weren't thinking about the eternal kingdom that Jesus was bringing, who was going to sit next to him, as it were, uh, in heaven, ruling over the world, but they were thinking about the political kingdom that they thought Jesus was going to bring. When Jesus would overthrow the Romans, when he would reestablish the kingdom of Israel, when he would sit on the throne of his father David in Jerusalem on earth, which of them would have the honor of being his second in command? By the way, that was their view, but that was an incorrect view. Okay? Jesus actually came to bring a spiritual kingdom that would envelop the entire world. Now, this wasn't just an abstract question. This isn't you know, like a question that we might discuss among ourselves. Who's going to be the greatest in God's kingdom? Because we know it's not going to be any of us, right? They were thinking it was going to be one of them. This was very personal for them. I mean, it wouldn't be very long before James and John would bring their mother to Jesus and would ask Jesus for the two seats of honor uh, in his kingdom. The disciples believed that one of them would have it. And the question was, well, which, which one? Now, the Bible tells us, Jesus tells us, the apostles tell us that we should be aiming for honor in Jesus' kingdom. You know, what they were seeking is not necessarily wrong. But we, the Bible also warns us that we need to seek it in the right way, right? Uh, the way they were seeking it was wrong. On the one hand, Paul writes to the Corinthians this in 1 Corinthians 9, verse 24. Do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but only one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may win. Sounds to me like Paul's telling us here that we need to seek to be first place. Only one gets the prize. Make sure you're the one who gets it. That's the kind of effort we're to put into it. But on the other hand, we're also told in Scripture that we are not to serve ourselves or to do anything at the expense of other people. Paul writes to the Philippians in Philippians 2 verse 3, do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit. So the question is, how can we strive to win, you know, first place, and at the same time not be self-centered, you know, having self-interest in mind? Well, that's what Jesus now shows his disciples. That's the lesson he's going to teach them. Luke writes this, in verses 47 and 48. But Jesus, knowing what they were thinking in their heart, took a child and stood him by his side and said to them, whoever receives this child in my name receives me. And whoever receives me receives him who sent me. For the one who is least among all of you, this is the one who is great. Now, Jesus obviously heard them arguing. You know, they're, they're all gathering or, or walking together in a group. And he also knew what the argument was about. 
And he knew more importantly what was behind the argument, right? Because he knew what they were thinking in their heart. He knew this was a matter for them of selfish ambition. I want to be first. Now, this reminds us, of course, that our Lord not only knows what it is we're doing, right? He also knows why we're doing what it is we're doing. And that's why it's important that we not only do what he wants us to do, that we not only obey him, but that we always obey him with the right motives, okay? Because without the right motive, even the greatest sacrifices that we make for the Lord will mean nothing to him. Remember what Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 13, 3, if I give all my possessions to feed the poor, and if I surrender my body to be burned, but do not have love, it profits me nothing. How would you like to give your life and everything you possess only to have it amount to nothing in the eyes of the Lord? Well, that's what happens when you do it with the wrong motive. And so Jesus is going to be correcting not necessarily their desire for the place of honor, but their motive behind how they're going to actually obtain this. He gave them an object lesson. That's what the child is all about. He took a child and stood him by his side. Now, as we read through the Bible, we do see that Jesus was often expressing tenderness towards children, wasn't he? And he used them as examples. He even used them seemingly oddly, at least in my thinking is quite odd, as spiritual examples of what we ought to be. And the question is, why did Jesus use children for that purpose? What did he see in them that maybe we don't see? Well... Is it because, as many think, that children are sweet and innocent, okay, that they have pure hearts, untainted by sin, okay? They're not guilty of, of anything. They're pure and holy because they're not yet old enough, really, to know what they're doing, and so they're really not guilty of having done anything wrong. They haven't reached, as it were, that age of accountability. Well, you know, that's not what the Bible teaches, is it? The Bible teaches that there's really no difference between the child and ourselves with regard to sin. Okay, how do we know that? Well, the fact that children die, okay, because death are the wages of sin. And even infants die, which means that infants are guilty. By the way, we, we talked this morning, and I just reviewed it, about certain things in the Bible that maybe we don't see and maybe we don't understand and maybe we don't accept. Well, this is one of those disputed points, you know. Are children innocent? Are they not innocent? Okay. Well, the Bible says that we're all guilty, right? Think about what Paul writes in Romans 5, verse 12. Through one man, sin entered into the world and death through sin. And so death spread to all men because all sinned. Why do people die? It's because of sin. How many people are affected by it? Everyone. Everyone who dies, it's the consequence of sin. We read in the Bible that when God would bring judgment on a nation, even when he brought judgment on his own nation, the children were also included in that judgment. Children died. Um, John Wesley once said that... Um, the fact that children die means that they must deserve to die because God never would you know, allow someone to die who was innocent. So children are included. Paul tells us in Romans 3 verse 10, there is none righteous, not even one. Well, there's, there's more than one infant, more than one child in the world. Are, are these children righteous? Not according to the apostle Paul. This includes children. And the fact that children actually do have sinful hearts becomes clear as soon as they're old enough to express what actually is in their hearts. And actually, it doesn't take very long, does it? If you've ever had children, you know. It isn't very long before you're having to correct your children. You know from your own experience how many times you had to be corrected when your parents were raising you. And the reason was because you desired things that you shouldn't desire. Now, I think the reason why Jesus here is using children as illustrations was not because they were absolutely pure. It wasn't absolute purity. It wasn't because they're righteous. It wasn't because they're sweet and innocent. But I think it was because of their, we might call, relative purity. I think it's because, as far as human beings go, they're closer to what he is like than adults are. Okay? I think we would have to admit that.
Children have corrupt hearts. They are sinners. You know, we came into this world as sinners. Again, uh, David wrote in Psalm 51, you know, that he basically was conceived in sin, wasn't he? That's the reason why he did what he did. And it's not that his mother was, was, did something immoral, but it's just that everyone who comes into this world is affected by that sin. Uh, but the sin that is in a child's heart has not grown to the point that it will become later. Okay, it's, it's, it's there, but it hasn't grown to the extent that it will. I mean, have you ever looked at, uh, you know, people we consider to be pretty hardcore sinners, you know, drug dealers, pimps, prostitutes, murderers, and wonder how they became like that? Okay, how they went from a baby in their mother's arms to what they are now. Well, we know it didn't happen all at once. We know that their sin grew little by little and step by step when it was not resisted, when it was not checked, until they became what they are, what we would all actually be except by the grace of God. And that's the reason why the Lord tells us we need to fight against the sin that's within our hearts and put it to death because if we don't, it, it will grow. And of course, if it's completely unchecked, it will destroy us. But God has given us the Holy Spirit so that we will fight against it. You know, I was thinking about uh, a way to illustrate this, and, and really, um, there, there's a, re well, I guess you would call a reality show that's um, on television called MasterChef. I don't know if you've ever seen it. It's basically cooking, you know. And they have two versions of it. You know, they have the adult version, and they have the children's version. Now, when you watch the adults compete, you know, what do you see? You see a lot of positioning, you see a lot of climbing each over, you know, each person climbing over the other's back, you see backbiting, ill will, a lot of bleeped out words, okay? But when the children compete, what, what do you see? You know, if you've watched the MasterChef Junior, you basically see a spirit of, of good sportsmanship. They appear to be genuinely happy for their friends when their friends win and they don't win, and when they leave, they leave wishing their friends well, that, that they hope they do well, and that, that they win. That's, that's typically not what you see among the adults. Now, ask yourself this question. If, if you were a teacher, and again, we, we might all answer this a little bit differently, but if you were a teacher, what age group would you rather teach? Would you rather teach toddlers or kindergartners, grade schoolers, you know, middle school, high school? college, maybe postgraduate? Well, you know, your answer to that question may say something about how you perceive the character of each age group. I think as the children progress, they get more and more difficult. You know, as parents, um, you know, you, you, when you're raising your children, when they're really small, you know, there, there are issues you have to deal with, or corrective, you know, problems they have to correct and so forth. But overall, I think we, we really enjoy that very early age. And then when they go through the, the teen years, that, that's kind of tough, isn't it? Uh, and that's because this principle of sin grows. I mean, we all, it grew in all of us. You know, we're all the same. Now, Jesus is telling his disciples here, I think, that he would have them behave more like children than adults. And what they were doing was behaving like adults in the way that they were behaving towards one another. He would have them be like children because this is more like his own character. If they did this, not only would they be of more help to one another, but they would also better represent him. So when Jesus says, whoever receives this child in my name receives me, do you think that Jesus just took a child at random and said, this child, okay, if you receive this child, you receive me, not that child, not that one, but this one, okay, do you think that there was something special about that child? I don't think he was talking about that particular child. I think he was saying whoever receives basically um, them as they reflect this childlike character, which again is closer to Jesus' character, they receive him. And Jesus says something to buttress that when he says whoever receives him receives uh, basically his father because he is reflecting the character of his father. Okay, do you see the connection? Jesus says, if you receive me, you receive the Father, because I'm like the Father. If you receive this child, then you're receiving me, because this child is like me. Now, how do we know that that's what Jesus means here, and he's not talking about that particular child? Well, because um, 
of, of what he also says um, next in verse 48. For the one who is least among all of you, this is the one who is great. Now think about how could that follow from what Jesus is talking about if he's referring to that random child, that this is the one you have to receive to receive me. Now he's saying, if you are like this child and reflect my character, then whoever receives you receives me, whoever receives me receives the Father who sent me for the one who is least among all of you, the one who is humble, you see. This is the one who is great. Jesus is telling us here that the one who humbles himself to become the least of all, like, again, like this child, the expression of good sportsmanship and love that they have, which is, again, not like adults, to love and to serve others, this is the one who is the greatest. So Jesus here, again, is answering the question, how can I strive to be the best in the kingdom of heaven and at the same time honor the Lord? How can I run in such a way that I might win and yet not be fueled by a self-centered ambition? Well, it's only, Jesus says, by trying to outdo one another in humility in loving and serving one another. Again, this is what Paul meant when he wrote to the Romans in Romans 12, verse 10. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. And this important statement, give preference to one another in honor, which essentially means try to outdo one another in showing honor to each other. Instead of racing to the top, we're supposed to be racing to the bottom. The servant of all is the greatest of all, the one who humbles himself the most to serve others. The servant of all, that is the one who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven, not the one who climbs over his brother's back to gain recognition. You know, the more recognition, the greater you are. No, the, the more you humble yourself, the more invisible, the more you serve, the more you love, then you will be great in the Lord's eyes. We may, we may not even know who the greatest was because they're the people who may be more, uh, or I should say, you know, more invisible or, or less likely to be seen. So again, the first point is we need to be humble towards one another. We need to serve one another. But secondly, we're also to have this attitude of humility and love towards those who are a part of our particular group, our particular denomination. After Jesus finished his object lesson, Luke writes this in Luke 9, verse 49. John answered and said, Master, we saw someone casting out demons in your name, and we tried to prevent him because he does not follow along with us. Now, connecting this with what we've just seen, John is saying something like this. Okay, Jesus, we're to humble ourselves to serve each other, but what about those who aren't serving with us? We saw somebody was ministering in your name, and we tried to stop him because he wasn't ministering with us. Did we do the right thing? Well, you know, it's interesting, first of all, that, that this exists. I mean, have you ever read this, this passage and wonder who this guy might have been who was casting out demons in the name of the Lord and why he wasn't following along with Jesus? You know, it's interesting that there were others who were serving Jesus at the same time as the disciples and Jesus was walking the earth who weren't actually following him. But we do, uh, it really shouldn't surprise us because we, we see a, a history of this in the Bible that um, even though the Lord primarily worked with a particular group of people, uh, he often worked with, with others. Uh, you ever wondered about Melchizedek? By the way, Melchizedek was not... Jesus, okay? Uh, Jesus was a part of that priestly order, and he was like Melchizedek, but he was not Melchizedek. We don't even know who Melchizedek essentially was, except that he was a priest of God, and his, his um, well, he was the, what, the king of righteousness. His, his name means the king of righteousness, and he was the, um, the king of Salem, which means the king of peace. But he lived during the time of Abraham, and he wasn't in Abraham's Line. He certainly wasn't a child of Abraham. He was greater than Abraham. Abraham paid tithes to him. Who is Melchizedek? Somebody else that was serving the Lord outside of the group that we normally see serving the Lord. What about Job? You know, it's generally believed that Job lived at the same time as Abraham, but who is Job? He was perhaps one of the most righteous men who lived in the world at that time, but he was not connected to 
with, with Abraham. The Lord was working outside of Abraham's line. You ever wonder about Jethro, um, <laughs> Moses' father-in-law, right? Uh, he was a priest of God, a priest of Midian. He offered sacrifices to the Lord. He was a Midianite. Now, at least in this case, we, we know what his connection is to Abraham, okay? We, we don't know about Melchizedek or Job, but we know that Midian was connected with Abraham in that he was Abraham's son. Midian was Abraham's son by Keturah, which is Abraham's second wife after Sarah died. I think as we read the Old Testament, sometimes we can get the impression that God is dealing exclusively with Abraham and his descendants. That wasn't always necessarily the case. There were exceptions. The same thing is true in the New Testament. In the book of Acts, we find Apollos, right? One who is mighty in the scriptures, who comes speaking and teaching about Jesus, apart from the disciples, right? He wasn't discipled by Jesus. He didn't follow Jesus. Um, and apparently, he wasn't uh, going along with the, the party line as far as, you know, with that group. Now, Luke tells us about this particular individual that John was, um, he said that, you know, we tried to stop him from, from serving you. Now, the fact that the Bible focuses on Jesus and his disciples should not lead us to think that there was nobody else who believed in Jesus, there was nobody else who was serving Jesus but the disciples. I mean, think about Nicodemus. He was a disciple secretly, Joseph of Arimathea, and they weren't following Jesus physically, but they still believed in him. So were the disciples right in trying to stop this man they saw from ministering in Jesus' name because he wasn't following Jesus? Well, no, the answer was no. Jesus said whoever was not against them was for them. Certainly, um, we know something about Apollos. You know, he was acquainted with the baptism of John. Okay, so Apollos may have been a disciple of John or a disciple of one of the disciples of John. We don't know about this other man. Perhaps he was as well, but there were those who had followed John, we know from Scripture, that continued to minister basically what they understood of John's ministry to others. They were still serving Jesus. As a matter of fact, Paul comes across a group in Ephesus, doesn't he? who hadn't received the Holy Spirit because they were only acquainted with the baptism of John, but they were still serving the Lord. And then they get more information. Uh, Paul tells them about Jesus. And in the case of Apollos, we know Aquila and Priscilla took him aside and explained to him more accurately the things of the Lord, and that just empowered him even more to preach the gospel. They were serving the Lord, okay? And for that, Jesus was saying they should be thankful. And you know, that needs to be our attitude as well, right? Because there are many true believers serving our Lord in many different denominations. We need to be thankful for that because the OPC is really a relatively small denomination. If we were the only believers in the world, we'd be in some pretty serious trouble, right? We don't even collectively make up enough people to, to, uh, to make one mega church. But there are, are lots of other churches and lots of other believers now, it is true that they may not necessarily believe exactly the way we do. If they did, maybe we'd all be this, you know, part of one denomination. But since they have embraced Jesus through the gospel, that is, of course, if they have done so, we are to embrace them as brothers and sisters in the Lord Jesus Christ, and we should humbly thank the Lord when we see them serving our Lord. Because ultimately our goal is not to buttress any particular denomination. It is to see Jesus glorified. And if someone is serving the Lord, we need to be thankful that the Lord has raised him up, has saved that person, and that person is serving him. So may the Lord help us understand that so that we don't try to get in the way, the way that John and, and the other disciples tried to get in the way of this particular individual, but may the Lord help us also to serve them, even as we would serve one another, by praying for them and encouraging them in the Lord. Well, may the Lord help us uh, to learn from, from this example. Let's, uh, let's bow in prayer, shall we?